Good morning, everyone. So we're going to um, begin this study with a word of prayer. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for the study this morning and that we can join together in opening up your word and studying it and looking for light. And we ask for your presence through your Holy Spirit uh, to speak to our hearts, to bring conviction and power to our, our lives and that we can be an influence for good in this world. We ask, Lord, that as we look at Daniel chapter 11 further, that you can guide and direct in where we should go in this study. We pray and ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so last week we did a lot of work to get this line drawn out. And the, the main thing I like about this line is that these way marks come from looking at what's actually in Daniel chapter 11. So, I mean, that sort of makes sense. We should think that we're if we're going to have a line, we're going to base it upon what we see in that chapter, uh, the verses. So it was just basically finding what events that they refer to. And one of the keys that we have in marking these way marks, whether they're the exact start, that's, you know, because we we have a period of darkness. We could say the period of darkness could have started in 330, but we used um, the verse that we had there dealing with ships of Kittim. That's why we started with 410 and the 66 years to the time of the end. So the time of the end is going to be the fall of Western Rome. And then 32 years later, we have Clovis's baptism. So we have the fall of Western Rome. I have there the seat, but, you know, that's first going to be given in 330. But really, by the time Western Rome falls, we could say that the papacy now has control of Rome. And then the power, of course, is the military power. That's Clovis. And the great authority is uh, the papal power, um, having this religious power. So that's uh, Revelation 13, verse 2. So the dragon gave him his power, seat, and great authority. And then we see those established as the second angel's message. So the great authority with the imperial edict of focus. And uh, the purpose of this edict had to do with the religious authority of the papacy. And it is a date that often was used to ch start the 1260. Uh, then we have the Pantheon given to the papacy on August 1st, 608. And uh, just trying to, th so there's going to be a change in, um, change in, in um, emperors. And I'm just trying to think of their names. Should actually have their names there. I can't think of it. Not Benedict, but it's, uh, anybody, ben ben Benefice or, what was the, what was the name of the, that wasn't uh there was the third and the fourth. Here I just gotta look this up again. What was the guy's name? So we've got focus, and he's so he's the emperor. He's going to give this the Pope's name is Boniface. So Pope Boniface the third is the one who is the Pope with the Imperial Edict of Focus, and then the Pantheon is going to be given to the papacy, and that's going to be uh, Boniface the Fourth who is given that. So that's the authority, the seat, and then the power. Uh, we're going to look at when uh, Charlemagne submits to the pap papacy in order to become the emperor, and that's in 800, December 25th, 800 AD. And then we just mark the time at the end when the Pope is taken captive as the arrival of the third message. There's not many people here this morning, but um, I think we're pretty satisfied with this, that uh, the basic idea here in Daniel chapter 11, dealing with papal Rome, bringing us up to Daniel 11, verse 40a. So we're going from verse 30 to verse 40. And that gives us the history of papal Rome, just as we did the history of pagan Rome, right? So we remember we had this, this whole idea of this appointed time. So verse 29 is going to talk about the appointed time. And we also have the appointed time in um, verse 27. So the time of the end, the appointed time there, 1798 to 1844. And in this, in verse 29, 
it's it's going to be talking about what happens in 1989, right? Because there we're going to have the king of the south uh, being defeated by the king of the north. So then it's going to describe this history. Sorry, I blanked the screen there because I'm looking at the Bible verses here. <clears throat> so the idea here is that it's going to talk about this history, uh, the latter and the former. So the former is going to be the fall of Egypt. The latter is going to be the fall of Rome. And then it's going to describe the fall of Rome. And that fall of Rome is then going to mark the beginning of the papacy. So it, it fits so nicely. Everything dovetails in very nicely in this understanding of Daniel chapter 11. It, it just flows so much better. The interpretation of the text, because otherwise it just seemed to me before in the past that we're, we're sort of picking, trying to find these events, but there's no story behind it. There's no continuum. I don't know if other people have the same feeling of how when we studied Daniel chapter 11 in the past, but there didn't seem to be a purpose. And so the purpose now is really an expansion as we've talked about of Daniel chapter two, seven, you know, eight, nine. Uh, these chapters are being developed in, in this history, answering the questions that still are unanswered at the beginning of chapter 10. So we know he understands the 70 weeks and we know he understands the 2300 days. So this is just giving us the rest of this history. And the, the main thing is that we see 1798 and 1989 in verse 27 and 29, which we're going to see then in verse 40, A and B, uh, not 1798 and 1989 again. And that's something that we've never noticed before. And um, so we, we have this and now we have to figure out where to go. So my view is that we do have to try to figure out the present truth application of these verses. So the one thing that we can say is that we started here in verse 25, dealing with the end of pagan Rome. We still haven't written in the present truth applications of those verses. So we have a lot of work as far as putting in for the present truth application. And, and I try to think of how to approach this because we know it's this history, specifically when we get to uh, the history of papal Rome, that Ellen White quotes and says that the history in connection with this prophecy will be repeated. So specifically, she mentions those verses, and that is the rise of the papacy. Um, that statement, I'm just going to find it here. Well, I'm just going to read a few uh, passages. This one's from Selected Messages, book two. All that God is in prophetic history specified, specified to be fulfilled in the past has been, and all that is yet to come in its order will be. Daniel, God's prophet, stands in his place. John stands in his place. In the Revelation, the line of the tribe of Judah has opened to the students of prophecy the book of Daniel, and thus is Daniel standing in his place. He bears his testimony, that which the Lord revealed to him in vision in the great and solemn events, which we must know as we stand in the very threshold of their fulfillment. In history and prophecy, the word of God portrays the long-continued conflict between truth and error. That conflict is yet in progress. Those things which have been will be repeated. Old controversies will be revived. And new theories will be continually arising. But God's people, who in their belief and fulfillment of prophecy have acted apart in the proclamation of the first, second, and third angels' messages, know where they stand. They have an experience that is more precious than fine gold. They are to stand firm as a rock, holding the beginning of their confidence steadfast unto the end. Now, so one of the things here when we look at this, this statement we know that there is this proclamation of the first, second, and third angel's messages. And one of the things that has guided us is this line upon line that is looking at Millerite history as this pattern. And so when we look at Daniel chapter 11 and we take the history of papal Rome and we put it on a line and we can see clearly that, that we're not just arbitrarily placing waymarks, that they have a purpose. Um, you know, this, this purpose 
of prophecy is something that to be a part of our experience. And we know that in the last days, that there is this proclamation of the first, second, and third angels' messages. Now, for Seventh-day Adventists generally, they don't know what that means. I mean, it, it's something that, that we have talked about as Adventists. I mean, and it used to be a major part of the symbol of the Adventist church. Now they kind of are stylized um, in the new uh, symbol for Adventism. That you can't really tell they're angels. The idea here is that, that we actually have to proclaim the first, second, and angels' messages, and it's going to become a part of our experience. And that's what this movement is really about, is, is not just understanding those messages, but experiencing them. And when we reject God's leading in the July 18, 2020 warning, we are actually rejecting that experience. So we have to hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. And, and that's what's not happening for the vast majority of this movement, just as it didn't happen for the vast majority of <clears throat> the Millerites and even many Adventists. So when we look at, at the book of Daniel, we look at these verses, just trying to, trying to find the quote. Probably Dwight knows where it is dealing with where she quotes this, these, this part of Daniel chapter 11, the last verses. Uh, this must be it. Here it is. Okay. <clears throat> we have no time to lose. Troublous times are before us. The world is stirred with the spirit of war. Soon the scenes of trouble spoken of in the prophecies will take place. The prophecy in the 11th of Daniel has nearly reached its complete fulfillment. So that means that at that time it hadn't reached its fulfillment, right? That is the last few verses. Much of the history that has taken place in fulfillment of this prophecy will be repeated. In the 30th verse, a power is spoken of that shall be grieved in return and have indignation against the Holy Covenant. So shall he do. He shall even return and have intelligence with them that forsake the Holy Covenant. And then she continues to quote verses 31 to 36. Right. So they just put the one verse there, not because this is manuscript releases and they didn't. So if we saw it in its original, we would have all those verses quoted. Uh, so she quotes those verses, which we have drawn out. Scenes similar to those described in these words will take place. We see evidence that Satan is fast obtaining the control of human minds who have not the fear of God before them. That all read and understand the prophecies of this book, for we are now entering upon the time of trouble spoken of. And then she quotes Daniel 12, verse 1 to 4. Scenes similar to those described in these words. Oh, I already read that. The spirit of the Lord is not is being withdrawn from the world. It is no time now for men to exalt themselves. It is no time for the people of God to be erecting costly buildings or to be using the Lord's entrusted talent of means in glorifying themselves. Whatever we do, we should do economically. The buildings we erect should be plain without useless display. Let us beware of selfish greed. Letter 103, 1904. Now, I mean, this council has never been followed that I know of. Does the church use a lot of useless display in the buildings that it builds? Quite a bit. Yeah. And they always have excuses for it, right? You know, I mean, obviously our churches should be clean and neat and, and, and attractive and, and so forth. But, there's all kinds of money that's wasted that's just it serves no purpose. But anyway, that's a whole other topic. The main thing that we're looking at here is that uh, these verses that we have put on a line, that much of the history taken place in fulfillment of this prophecy will be repeated. And so we believe that we have repeated that history, right? That, that we are in the process of going through that repeat of history. That's the whole basis of this movement. So back in, um, you know, the, the 1980s, there was this guy, Charles Wheeling, um, you know, who was taking those types of statements and then trying. Brother what's, Theodore, what was that? Yeah. What was that last quote? What was, um, it was letters 103. Yeah. Letter 103, um, 
19 what? Uh, 1904. Oh, okay, thank you. I mean, I quoted it from manuscript releases, volume 13, uh, whatever page that is, 394. <clears throat> so 13 manuscript releases, 394, but yeah, letter 103, 1904. So we had, you know, people like Charles Wheeling who were uh, taking that and then trying to reapply the prophecies themselves. And the difference there is, is what? So if we, if we say that history in connection with the fulfilled prophecy is repeated, or we say that a prophecy is going to be repeated, what, what is the difference? Why do we make that distinction? Because to some people, it might seem like it's the same thing. Well, the prophecies repeated, the history in connection with the fulfilled prophecies repeated. What's the difference? So what have we been doing? Why have we spent so much time looking at the historical application of these prophecies? Because if we could, if we could yeah, just. We need a background. You got to have a background. The source, source is background. Okay. So, so when we look at the history that's fulfilled, because it's a history in connection with this prophecies that's being repeated. It limits how we understand it, right? It, it guides how we interpret what's happening now. Yeah, exactly. So we're repeating history, and, and that history happens in a certain pattern, and that pattern is, is a prophetic pattern. So if I just said, well, the prophecy is going to be repeated, I could manipulate that prophecy in lots of different ways, and not to be disrespectful, disrespectful of Jeff, but that's what he's doing now. So because he's not following the line upon line, he now can just take prophecies out of their proper context and apply them sort of willy-nilly to, to events that are happening now. We need to be restricted by, by, by fulfilled prophecy in the past. We can't just apply things however we want to apply them. And this was a problem in the movement, actually, for quite a while. So, you know, definitely uh, Parminder was uh, doing a lot of that. But even Jeff was himself in the past. And sometimes I pointed these things out to him. And, and if I did, you know, he would recognize it. But there's just such a temptation to interpret things that we see on the news and try to decide uh, what those, you know, what prophecy or what what event, uh, even if we're looking at history, you know, what event applies to that without considering that there is a line that has to be followed. We have to know where we are in a story to know what applies. And we are, we do know that a waymark, an event, uh, can represent different way marks in different lines. So 9-11 can represent different things in different lines. But to, to understand that, I still need a line. Right? Without the understanding of the lines, which I think is the main problem that the movement has had, there's no way that we can interpret what's happening around us. We're always going to jump to conclusions that aren't warranted. So that's why it's so important that we were able to draw out this line of the history of papal Rome, just as we did with, with pagan Rome. And, and that is we can look at these way marks. And if we're understanding where we are in a line, we can see how those all bring light to where we are presently. So we can take this line now and we can say, we, we, we will have all kinds of keys to mark this in a line in our history. Now, the main thing that, that we have, the way that we've approached this, and we started this with the book of Judges, but uh, really specifically, is that we understood our history is connected to time. The second coming of Christ, we have no knowledge of when that is going to be. It's not part of our lines, so to, so to speak. That is, what we have done in making this application is that the only way that we can understand it at the present is to apply it to the present. We can't apply it really to the future yet. That is, we, we know it's representing the future and we, we can recognize 
you know, the general idea of what's going to happen. But we can't, we can't believe that we're someplace that we're not. I mean, we can, we can do it, but it wouldn't be correct. So we need to recognize what history we're repeating and how we're applying it. So now we look at this history and we want to apply it to our history. So this is the history of the papacy. So we, we looked at the history of, of Medo-Persia. We applied it to our history, and that was guided by the kings or the presidents. We looked at the history of Greece. And what was it that guided us in Greece? Anybody remember? What was Greece about? So Persia was about the United States, right? Um, and, and that was related to... Uh, our predictions, right? Our understanding of that history, the lines that Jeff has given us, right? So if we go back and we look at these other lines, uh, Greece is going to be, so it's going to be about these, uh, the division of Alexander's empire and this battle between the North and the South. And so how did we, how did we apply that to our history? Looking at this chart, if you can remember back that long ago. So we looked at, these six Syrian wars after the death of Alexander, and we put them on our line. And what is it that we see? We see from the time of the end in 1989, and the first and second angels' messages are going to refer to this history. So 1989 to 911 is the first angels' message, and then from 11:9 to uh, December 25th, 2021 is the second angels' message. So what is what is Greece representing? Now there's external events. There's the Soviet Afghan War. You know, there's there's um, the fall of the Soviet Union. There's the Patriot Act, and then we jump into our, you know, we we could say we're just jumping into our internal line, but that's that's what was happening in this movement, right? So we're applying it to this movement. So what is it that Greece is illustrating? Nobody knows what Greece is illustrating. What? Why is it? Why? Yeah, uh, say globalism. Okay, so it's it's addressing. Well, it's a battle between the king of the north and the king of the south, right? That's that's yeah. the battle going on. Right. So it, it's dealing with uh, this this power which we call Greece globalism, and then we have. Um, you know, obviously the fall of the Soviet Union, the Patriot Act, spiritual formation, nine eleven there. But then we go to 11.9. So when we do that, why, why are we doing that? Why are we looking at those 777 days? And, and we're also going to have, uh, you know, April 10th, 2024 in there. Because that's going to be, so, so we had that in there. Why did we have that in there? I don't know if you can see that really clearly, but. So we have 777 days. They go to a period of 837 days from December 25th, 2021 to April 10th, 2024. We have that in that line. And that's, that's taking the, those times in these times, whatever it is, 92, the Hebrew number and 6256. And so we're counting from 911 to April 10th, 2024. So that's going to be the first day of the first month, right? And then from there, there's going to be six years. 186 days, which is um, that number Chazon, 2377, is six years, 186 days. So, so what is this line telling us? So it's about globalism. Okay, so we seem to have forgotten. So when we go back to this line, we know that what's happening in the United States, the civil war that's happening in the United States, is affecting God's people. And we made we made predictions in that 777 days. And those predictions were of God. Now, this one's specifically addressing when the Democrats end up because you got January 6, 2021. So this is going to be this battle between the king of the north and the king of the south. But we don't have July 18th in this line, which is it's just part of those 777 days. The date that we're marking here is January 6, 2021. That's going to be the siege of Washington. So that's going to be the formalization of a message. So this message that we get on November 9th, 2019, 
it's going to be about this battle between the king of the north and the king of the south that we mistakenly apply to a battle between Russia and the United States. But Russia is not the power. It's the globalists. And the globalists are going to defeat, uh, that is, the king of the south is going to defeat the king of the north. So why do we have, though, this uh, from 9-11 to April 10th, 2024? So we have the 777 days and then the 837 days added on to it, which is 3 times 3 times 3 times 31, or 8 times 3 times 7 equals 168. So we can see the symbol there of the number of hours in a week. Um, so we have the week of Christ represented the midst of the week. Is is Greece the power that's going to crucify Christ? No, it's a, it's paving a way for the papacy to do that. Yeah, well, it's going to be pagan Rome that's going to crucify Christ, right? So, yeah. so Greece, so these different kingdoms, they all they all parallel what's happening. One of the things we found when we studied of the globalists is that the globalists are not the ones responsible for the Sunday law. Right, it's the United States that's responsible for the Sunday law. Right, the globalists have have you know they're involved in a pandemic. They they typify things that are going to happen later, but the power uh, that is going to bring in the Sunday law is the United States. Now, of course, the papacy is the power ultimately that's in control. So we have, you know, we when we look at these different uh, kingdoms. Uh, Medo Persia represents the apostate Protestants, right? Greece represents the globalists and Rome represents the papacy. So if that's the case, that's the dragon, the beast and the false prophet. Not exactly in that order, the other different order, but you understand what I'm saying. It's, it's the parts of Babylon, but none of those by themselves, that is Medo Persia. It's not going to be the power at the end of the world. I mean, it is, it's typified in the United States, but it's Rome is the final kingdom, right? Pagan Rome first and then papal Rome, but it's still Rome. And the United States is still part of Rome, right? Even though we, we look at these kingdoms and we say, well, there's Babylon, Babylon, Medo, Persia, Greece, Rome, Rome, first Rome pagan, Rome papal, then the United States, then the UN, right? So we, we can mark these out in that way. But we know that all of those last kingdoms are still Rome. Rome is still in charge. And the United States has modeled itself after Rome, the Roman Republic. So when we look at, uh, at Greece, we can see that we could apply it to our history. But the one that's going to be that Ellen White single, singles out is the history of papal Rome, right? So here we have uh, pagan Rome, the history of pagan Rome, and we, we had all kinds of ways in which we connected this to our history, right? Because pagan Rome obviously typifies papal Rome. And so we looked at, at, at the 666 years of, of pagan Rome, and then we could parallel that to our history. So we could take, you know, this league with the Jews, particularly, we could put this to 1989. And we could bring this all the way, 508, all the way up to December 25th, 2021. So there's lots of details there. I'm not going to go through all that. So then when we started looking at, uh, and, and then we're going to have the end of Pagan Rome. So I'm not sure why I didn't put that later. So, so now this is the problem that we have. So we've done all of that. And now when we're going to deal with the end of Pagan Rome here, we didn't put in a present truth application. Right. We moved ahead and got in the and put the present truth application of papal Rome or, or, or historic application of pagan Rome before we could do the present truth application here of this part of pagan Rome. So we did papal Rome. It's historical application. Now we're going back to pagan Rome. And we understood that this is the end of pagan Rome, that it's going to bring up. Uh, the Battle of Actium, so that this was uh, a repeat of history, so to speak. That is, it's a repeat and enlarge. So, so these verses here, we have to do something with them, even before we go into to papal Rome. Okay, so 
This is where we have to start working again. We have to start digging here. So if you remember that we had already dealt with this history earlier, right? So you're going to have uh, with these um, in verse 23, and 24, that's going to address the, the Roman Jewish League and the destruction of Jerusalem, right? So that Roman Jewish League, that's, you know, 161 to 158 BC, you have that, that league, right? You're going to have Pompey come in with the siege of Jerusalem in 63 BC. You're going to have, um, this is going to lead all the way to the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD, right? So you're going to have, uh, the second siege, I mean, there's many sieges, but, you know, one in 63 and one in, and then 66 and then 70. Um, and then it's going to give us these periods of time, right? The battle of uh, marking 360 years from the battle of Actium to 330. And then we also have the battle of Pharsalus from 48 BC to 313. So we, we had this, this here. And and even before that, we had also gone back to the history of the crucifixion of Christ, right? So we went through Julius Caesar, Augustus Caesar, Tiberius Caesar, and then uh, the crucifixion of Christ, right? So all of this history has been covered. So in this repeat and enlarge, where they're now going to go back. So this is going to be another line in and of itself that we're going to have to to try to address how, how we're going to address this. I still don't know, but, but I think first I would want to get how we connect this with our history. So, so the question is why are they going back to this history of Octavian and Antony? So we know, of course, it's going to be about the battle of Acti. So, so he's filling in details of the start of that 360 years. So I know it's a it's a bad question. Why is, is such a broad question? But why are they doing this? Why is is Daniel chapter 11 going back? I mean, it's going to tell us why. But so why do we need why do they need to, to set up this history in its detail before they move to the end of of pagan Rome? I know I'm not asking this question very well. I don't want to answer it. Right. So we know in verse 29, at the time appointed, right? So that's November 9th, 1989. He, the papacy and the United States, the king of the north shall return and come toward the south, but it shall not be as the former or as the latter. So it's going to give us the former. So this former is this, the fall of Egypt. So why is Daniel 11 going back? It's already brought us up to the to the destruction of Jerusalem, which typifies the end of the world. And that's going to go back and it's going to give us this history of the fall of Egypt. And then it's going to give us the history of the fall of Rome. So why is it doing this? I want somebody to comment. I don't want you to just tell you. Well, uh, give us that's important. Well, it's important, but what specific, why is it important? Well, because everything, uh, uh, Rome establishes a vision. Okay, well, Rome establishes the vision. So, so the defeat of of the king of the south by Rome, right? The Battle of Actium and and what happens the year later in 30 AD is, is is significant. And this is going to be the former, right? That is, in verse 29, it's going to talk about what happens in 1989, right? That this is, this is the time of the end, the time appointed, right? They're, they're connected. So that time appointed, you know, I put here November 9th, 1989. Um, but at that time appointed, uh, we know that it's also referring to the time of the end, right? They're connected, right? And we see that in verse 27, where it says the end shall be at the time appointed. So at the end of the prophetic periods. And, and we put that as, as 1798, right? Tonight to 1844. But now it's going to say at the time appointed, he, the papacy, the USA king of the north shall come and towards the south. So it's saying that these histories, what happened with the Battle of Actium and what's 
and what happens with the fall of of Rome. <laughs> That these, that these things, they're typical of something that's going to happen even in the future, in 1989, in, in our history, because that's when the king of the north defeats the king of the south, Daniel 11, verse 40b. But it's not going to be as the former or as the latter. So it says that this is a comparison, but it's not going to be the same. And we asked this question before. We never answered it. Quite a while ago, like a month ago, maybe. So why are they telling us that these histories are parallel, but they're not the same? Because it doesn't say it shall be as the former and the latter. It says it's not going to be as the former and the latter. In what way is this not as the former or the latter? In what way is this line that starts on November 9th, 1989, not the same as the fall of Egypt and not the same as the fall of Rome, of Western Rome. Now, we know that when we look at verse 30, it says in which, right? So King James says four, but we put in which the ships of Kittim. So it's going to talk about the fall of pagan Rome. And it's going to talk then about the rise of papal Rome. So it tells us something and nobody's ever answered that question. We can see that there's attempts to answer it, but they're not correct attempts because they don't understand the history. So it shall not be as the former or as the latter. In what way is it not the, as the same as the former and the latter? What what is different about our history? Well, we had a uh, we have a uh, had a spiritual application. Okay, there you go. So that's pretty simple, right? It's a spiritual yeah. application. Yep. That is, these are talking about events that we're dealing with literal kingdoms. The king of the south, the king of the north. These are not, when we look at it in our history, it's not dealing with Egypt. That is, the king of the south is not Egypt. The king of the north is not Syria. Right? Yes. Okay. So that So that's dealing with the former. Right? I mean... It's Rome, but Rome, Rome is the king of the north because it occupies that territory of Syria. Now, what about the fall of Western Rome? So it's not going to be as the former, right? So we know that it's, it's not literal king of the north and king of the south in our history or as the latter. So with the fall of Western Rome, in what way is it not the same? So we got for the former, we can say, well, we're not applying these things to the literal king of the north and the literal king of the south. Right. So this would refute the idea that, you know, Uriah Smith has that the king of the north is Turkey and the king of the south is Egypt. But saying it's not that way. Now, is there something else also about the latter that we can say is not the same? And we know this is pagan Rome that's going to fall, Western Rome. Um, not necessarily pagan Rome per se, but Western Rome. It's the fall of Western Rome that's being used. So in what way is it not as the latter? Because it's using both of these examples, saying it's not like either of them. <coughs> but I would assume that there is, there's two different things. There's, it's not like the former, like the fall of, of, of Egypt, because that was literal Egypt and literal you know, king of the north and king of the south. But what about with the fall of Western Rome? What is different about the fall of Western Rome, even though it parallels our history? What is different about it? What in what way is it not uh, that it's it's not going to be like it? What our history is not going to be like the fall of Western Rome? And we have there 410 to 476. So remember, the, the fall of Egypt is the king of the north defeating the king of the south. So, so the former one, it's like it because it typifies because the king of the north defeats the king of the south. But it's not like it because it's not literal. So when it comes to the latter, we're going to have the ships of Kittim come in and be involved in the fall of Western Rome. So how does that typify our history? The fall of Western Rome. This one should be easy. What is Western Rome paralleling? 
Is it not uh, the UN? Okay, the UN, you said? Yes, because uh, the reason why I said so is uh, when we look at um, how Western Rome fell, there is uh, Constantinople, and uh, that's uh, Turkey typifies uh, the United States of America, and okay, that... the seven kings. Yeah, so you're talking about, okay, so the capital is going to move from Rome to Constantinople. So, so yes. Rome is given over to the papacy, right? Yes. Okay, so, so when we have the fall of Western Rome, it's the fall of, of, of a civil power. Yes, fall, yes, fall yes. That's why I, I, I was looking... That's why I was looking at uh, the UN because we find that the purpose in the last days is going to marry the, the United Nations according to Revelation chapter 18, whereby she says that I'm no longer a widow. Okay. Well, yeah, so I, I don't know if I would say that it parallels the fall of the UN. I mean, it, it's definitely uh, a secular power rather than a religious power. But... Um, okay. But, uh, I mean, the fall, well, the way that I've always understood it is the fall of Western Rome represents the fall of the United States. I mean, the two republics. Now, you know, and A.T. Jones has a book called The Two Republics where he goes through and parallels uh, the fall of Rome and parallels it to our history. They and Rome also lost their republic. Yeah. So so it, it's typifying the basically the United States degenerating from a republic to to a dictatorship. See, I look at Greece representing the UN, the globalists. Now, the United States, of course, is going to be conquered by the globalists. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know if I put the UN in there. I think you have the right idea as far as, because we have the fall of Constantinople, and that's going to be a different different story. But we have Rome moving its capital to Constantinople. And, and that's what we're going to see, right? We're going to see that there's these steps in the fall of Western Rome. It's it's going to move its its capital. It's going to then have the ships of Kittim come in. And then, you know, Rome is going to fall. And then there's this progression. Uh, you know, the power seat and great authority is given over from pagan Rome to papal Rome. So um, that is the United States is going to be conquered by papal Rome, right? It's going to be yielding to papal Rome. So that's what happens to pagan Rome. So so that's going to happen to the United States. You have to think about that a bit. Okay, so so if we say that, that the fall of Western Rome is typifying the fall of the United States, right? Because the United States starts as a republic, ends up as a dicta- dictatorship, and then ultimately falls. And, and that's what Western Rome did. Now, how is it not the same? So we have this parallel. Why is he saying it's not as the latter? So we already understand the one is dealing with spiritual and literal. So what's the what's the way in which our history from 1989 to the Sunday Law is not the same as the fall of Western Rome from 410 to 476? It's not the same answer. We wouldn't say, well, it's not literal, it's spiritual. Football has to do with the uh, yeah, in, religious, yeah. religious, religious aspect. You're, you're a little muffled. That's the, I was saying our fall might have to do with the religious aspect. Okay. Aspect. Okay, so there is a, a religious aspect. Now, Rome falls to these Germanic tribes, but you know, it, it is really still an internal collapse to a large degree. I mean, there's a lot of reasons why these Germanic tribes end up conquering them. But one of the things is, uh, initially, Rome Rome's army was, the people who were in the army were Roman citizens. And the reason why somebody would be in the army is is that they would get um, land, and, and that was a way to establish yourself. You became a part of the military, when you're young, and if you survived, then um, you would have land given to you. You know, you would conquer some nations and so forth, and, and you would have all of this, this wealth. So you basically worked for your wages. But what ended up happening is Rome started 
like many, many militaries, they hire mercenaries. And a lot of the people that were then, as you go later into Rome, the people who are the soldiers are actually from the Germanic tribes themselves. So these, these tribes end up becoming the military for Rome and then eventually a turn on Rome. They eventually occupy Rome. So, so there's this gradual sort of uh, disintegration of, of Roman society uh, that occurs, right? So, so that's how Western Rome falls. Uh, it's a very simplistic way of looking at it, but, it, but really that's kind of what happened. It wasn't like, I mean, sure, these Germanic tribes, uh, you know, they, they come in and they, and they conquer Rome, but they had already been connected with Rome for, for a few hundred years, right? So, so it's not like they just came out of nowhere. Their leaders, you know, obviously they recognize, you know, they're basically working for Rome and then, and then they're going to come in, uh, and, and conquer Rome. That's what's eventually going to happen. So, but we have to figure out what way is it not the same. Now, in the former, I mean, we understand the spiritual and literal. But here, it's going to say, it's going to give us this description. So this description of the fall of, of pagan Rome is the setting up of the papacy. So it's, so when he says in which, which we put in there, it's just, it's going to just describe the fall of Western Rome. So he's going to have intelligence with them that forsake the Holy Covenant, apostate Christianity. Now, so if we start looking at this, if we start making a present truth application, I mean, we should be able to see, um, you know, what do the ships of Kittim represent in our history? When he's grieved and and returns and has indignation against uh, the Holy Covenant, we should have some application our history and then he's going to have return and have intelligence with them that forsake the holy covenant so we'd 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 say well there's apostate christianity we'd probably put apostate protestantism in there and arm shall stand on his part right so we know how we would apply that so but there are some things in here that we have to we have to sort through so we know that it's it's the same but there are there is something that's different and that's what we have to figure out in creating this line. So we have to figure out what way it's not the same. It doesn't specifically tell us, but we should be able to figure that out as we go through it. Um, now, one of the things that, that we have is we have this 1260 years. So, I mean, we know we're not applying uh, like a day for a day prophecy, right? We're not We're not applying a day for a year or anything like that. That is uh, one of the ways in which um, people like Charles Wheeling back in the 1980s was trying to apply a repeat of Daniel is he was applying uh, these periods of time in a literal sense. So so that would be wrong. Right. I mean, we're not going to say, well, 1260 years. We're just going to literally say it's 1260 days. So we get three and a half actual years and we're going to apply these time elements and make some predictions. Right. So that's one way in which it's not the same. That is, the time periods uh, aren't the same. Yet we do have time in our movement. So we do have time that's addressed, periods of time that are addressed, but it's different. And we're going to see all of this stuff that happens with the papacy in verse 36. That's going to be repeated. The papacy will exalt himself. And this is the papacy. So, So when we take this history and we address this as being the papacy, What's the difference between what happens with the papacy here and what happens with the papacy in our history? So if, if we look at this history, we see he's given, given his power seat and great authority from pagan Rome. It's given to papal Rome. It's going to be established by the papacy. OK, so let's let's put it this way. If it's not like the former. So the former, we're saying. Well, it's not going to be Egypt, and it's not going to be pagan Rome. It's not really the literal king of the north and the king of the south. It's, that it's typifying. That aspect isn't true. But is the papacy typifying the papacy? I would think yes. Okay. 
What about the United States? Is the papacy the one that brings in the Sunday law in our history? Technically, no. Right. Yeah. So, so the way in which it's not like the latter is that it is going to be the papacy that's behind everything. But the papacy is not going to be at the forefront. The papacy works in darkness in this history. Now, there comes a point, of course, where, because it starts with the Sunday law in the United States, but it's not evident to people that this is the papacy, that the papacy is behind it. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. <clears throat> Yeah, so, so we can see that these histories parallel what's happening, but they don't tell us everything. And, and definitely we're, we're not going to have the literal king of the north and king himself. So fall of Egypt is not going to be, it's not going to be Egypt at the end of the world. It's going to be spiritually Egypt. And then we have the fall of Western Rome. So in the fall of Western Rome, which is, is specifically referred to, this, this is the fall of the United States. Now, the papacy is going to, so in that history, right, in the fall of Western Rome, the papacy is the one that's going to be given the power seat and great authority. But in our history of the United States, where does it get its power, its seat, and its its authority, its great authority? Maybe that's not the best way to ask the question. But how would we parallel? I mean, we look at Daniel or, or Revelation chapter 13. So what's different when we look at Revelation chapter 13, then this history that we have lined up here, right? So we have this history. We have the fall of Western Rome, and then we're going to have the papacy. It's going to be given this power seat and great authority. So does the United States have a power and a seat? And does it give great authority to the papacy? And how does it do that? Revelation chapter 13. When uh, it makes it to be low. Okay. It makes an image to the beast, right? So, so right. we can, so when we look at Revelation chapter 12 and 13, we can see that Revelation 12 and 13, we already saw that those chapters are paralleling Daniel chapter 11. We, we can see that really clearly that there is a connection between Daniel chapter 11 and Revelation 12 and 13, right? Because we had, uh, you know, the 1260, the, the earth helping the woman, right? That's Revelation 12. And then in Revelation 13, the dragon gave him his power seat and great authority. So now when we look at that history and the repeat of that history, we're not looking for the rise of the papacy per se, to have a period of, you know, 126 literal days or anything like that. It's going to happen in this image to the beast. So this power that arises in 1798, the United States, it's now going to be this repeat of history. Okay. This second beast, this two horned beast, it's going to have the characteristics of the papacy, and we, we saw that that number 666, it, it connected, um, you know, it was basically dealing with um, uh, the history of pagan Rome. And the United States is, in a sense, paralleling the history of pagan Rome. But in its fall, it doesn't, it doesn't directly, I mean, it will, it'll put the papacy on the throne of the earth, ultimately. But in the history that's being repeated, the history in which we are in, it's being actuated by the United States. The United States itself morphs from being a republic to a dictatorship. So it's going to do all the things of the first beast before it. He exercised all the power of the first beast before him. That means the one that came before him, which is the papacy. He first has two horns like a lamb. So the United States comes at the end of 1798. That's at the time appointed, the time of the end. Right? He has two horns like a lamb, republicanism and Protestantism. But he's going to speak, speak as a dragon. Right? He's going to exercise all the power of the first beast before him. 
and caused the earth and then the dweller to worship the first beast whose deadly root was healed. And the, and how does the United States make the earth and then the dwell in the earth to worship the first beast? Are they going to say you need to worship the Pope in, in a direct way like that? Isn't it through their through the Sunday, the Sunday worship? So they're going to make this image to the beast, but it's it's not it's not as explicit as we're going to make an image to the beast, right? I mean, that's what they are doing, but it's not clear that they're doing that to the average person. This isn't really about Christianity's Christianity going back to Rome and and you know making the Pope the head of the church or anything like that. They're going to make an image to the papacy by using the doctrines of the papacy. So the image to the beast is not the beast itself. So people's thoughts and actions are going to be controlled. And that number, that 666 number, that is the mark of the beast. So we can see how people can receive the mark of the beast without actually recognizing that they're worshiping the beast. So does that make sense that that's how it's not like uh, the latter, or am I off track? That there is a difference in how the movement from pagan to papal Rome, even though it typifies our history, it's not going to be the same in that we're not we're not going to see that Rome, that papal Rome, is really the one behind the scenes. People are going to worship the image to the beast, and thus they're going to worship the beast, but they're going to do it in a sense unwittingly. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, that would seem. Yeah, well, you always agree with me, Jeff. Any anybody else who doesn't agree with me? <laughs> like, is there is there something I'm missing? Is there something that? Uh, that... As I said, at this point, I would say. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, it simply you. means uh, they will try to reform the the nation. Reform the nation, the United States. Yeah, because uh, A.T. Jones speaks of uh, national reform, that's uh, uh, the image to the beast, whereby the nation, instead of uh, the church, instead of using the Bible to convert people, but it uses the law of the land, which simply means the church now is the one which is controlling, and these are the apostate protestants, whereby they make a law, instead of uh, converting mm. people, but they make a law, which means people now fear the law, and not being converted truly. Exactly. So, so the the idea that often, you know, back in the 1990s, when people, I mean, there was this pastor Frank Johnson. He was uh, a pastor of one of the churches I went to when I was first an Adventist. Um, he, you know, he was so interested in in everything the Pope was doing, and lots of Adventists were. But you know, every every Sabbath he would have some because he always taught the Sabbath school for some reason. And, um, <clears throat> you know, it would always be something about how, the, the, you know, the Protestants are going back to the papacy, right? And, and a lot of Adventists had this idea that, you know, you're watching the Pope. And, and definitely we know that the papacy is is behind all of this. But the papacy, people don't need to become Catholics in order to worship the beast. They just need to act the churches need to act like the catholic church acted during that 1260 years and so there there's so many adventists with what's happening in the world they want to see a reform a going back to the morality of the past whatever you want you know to describe it as and they will welcome the image to the beast to do that right just like right. Yeah. Yeah. It's just the working, working person, you know, only just knows because he wants to get paid. Yeah. There, there's all this craziness going on in the world, and people people will willingly Seventh Day Adventists will willingly have the state come in and and put an end to it all with a dictatorship and think it's good. They will yes, think it's... things are necessary. I mean, that's one of the things that's that's been pointed out by many people in the past. I mean, obviously, we don't believe in killing babies. But the the anti-abortion movement 
is primarily a Catholic organized movement. You know, we can say, well, there's Protestants who organized it. But it's it's mostly a Catholic movement. Catholics and Protestants work together because Protestantism does not realize that that the evils of this world cannot be cured by anything other than the gospel. Right. So they're trying to look for justice in this world. They're trying to look for, you know, the problems of this world to be solved by governments. And as as Christians, we should know that politics is never going to solve the world's problems. The only thing that has any power is the gospel. And yet we, you know, cheer for the conservative candidates. Right? We want them to win because we want to get rid of all this nonsense that's happening. And yet we don't realize that we're buying into that message. So. So I think that's the way in which it's not as the latter, that it's 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 not going to be so obvious. We can't just look at the past and say, well, the Catholic Church is going to come back again and, you know, everybody's going to become Catholic. Well, it's under the radar. Yeah. It's going to be Protestants doing something that they think is good and moral and right and just. It's going to be a focus on the family. It's going to be a focus upon returning to God. And on all of that we see happening before our eyes right now. And, and and we can look at it and say, well, it seems good, right? You know, people are talking about God and, and um, you know, a lot more than they used to. But it, it's not it's not a return to the God of the Bible per se, right? And there might be some people that are good hearted and 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 sincere and what they're saying is the truth. But that's not how the majority of people will react. And that's not what's going to happen politically. Politically, it's going to move in a different direction than the gospel. So when the church loses the power of the gospel, it employs the power of the state. And that's what we're going to see happening. So that everything getting cleaned up is is just the preparation for the Sunday law. So in that way, it's not going to be as the latter. Okay. <clears throat> so we still, we still have, um, you know, to try to apply the, the present truth application to some of these verses. So we, we can say that this part here, the fall of Egypt is typifying something in our history, right? And, and what it's typifying is the fall of the Soviet Union. So we know that the fall of the Soviet Union here is going to represent Egypt. Or Egypt's going to represent the fall of the Soviet Union. We, we can agree with that. We, we sort of put that in place. The king of the north is the USA and the papacy. And, and they're going to come against the king of the south. Right. So that's 1989. So we know that. And, and and the king of the south, here we have Antony, who's the king of the south. He shall not stand. Octavian defeated him in the Battle of Actium. So we can say that this is, is typifying our history, not just 1798. Let's share the screen. I keep missing the button when we click on it. All right. So it's, it's, I mean, obviously the time of the end, 1798, we can see that, that there's parallels here. But here, this one is, is 1989 because the king of the north defeats the king of the south. And then we would have to look at how some of these things that we, we, we worked hard to get the historic application, how we would say, yea, they, Anthony's army, that feed of the portion of Egypt's meat, shall destroy him, and his army shall overflow, and many shall fall down slain. And we use the overflow as referring to uh, the Sunday law. And both these kings... Octavian and Anthony's heart shall be to do mischief. So historically, they both desire to control the Roman world. And they speak lies at one table. So that means there is a league that goes on between the king of the north and the king of the south. But it shall not prosper, for at the end shall be, the end shall be at the time appointed. Now, so again, this is actually going back earlier, right? So it's going to talk about the Battle of Actium. Right. And the death of Anthony. And then it's going to go back. So why does why do they keep going back 
after they've they've gone through this this line already, right? And now they're going to go back and say these these both and both these kings' hearts shall be to do mischief after one of them's already dead. Why do they go back and tell us this? How do we how do we address that? For it says, for yet the end shall be at the time appointed. Then shall he, the king of the north, return into his land with great riches, and his pagan Rome's heart shall be against the holy covenant, and he shall do and return to his own land. Right. So uh, bring home bring home the importance of it. Okay, so it's to bring home, so it's repeating it, but it's repeating it to give us some detail. To enlarge it, it's repeating or an enlargement. To zoom in, right? That's what uh, enlarging, and you zoom in. So, so we can say that this is a line within a line. That it's it's giving us this. We have this line, and now it's going to zoom into a way mark on that line. Now we can say, well, it's going back, but but there is something about that line that we need to understand. So this is this is going to be a bit tricky. So this is not going to be easy work because we want to do it correctly. Right? We could just guess, but it's not a good good plan. Right? We we need to have some way to understand this. So verse twenty five and twenty six, they're gonna they're gonna tell us about the Battle of Actium, and it and it's telling us about the Battle of Actium. Why is it telling us about the Battle of Actium? Because it's already talked about um, even for a time, right? So it's going to go up to the destruction of Jerusalem, all from, from the League to the destruction of Jerusalem. And the reason it does that is because earlier it's going to deal with the crucifixion of Christ. And, you know, all the way from from the rise of Imperial Rome, it's going to go into... Crucifixion of Christ, all the all the way up to there, and then, and then it's going to go back, right? So it's going to repeat and enlarge. It's going to go back to the Jewish League and deal with the destruction of Jerusalem, and then it's going to go back again, right? And give us some more detail. It's going to zoom in again to this story about the fall of Egypt, and then it's going to go back and zoom in again. And give us this story about Octavian and Antony, right? And their league, right? And then it's it's going to bring us even further. It's going to bring us to the time appointed, to the end of the prophetic periods. And then it's going to say, well, there's another time appointed, right? That's going to be November 9th, 1989. And it's going to say that that time appointed is going to be paralleled by the fall of of Egypt and by the fall of Rome, but it's going to be different, right? You see how it, how this is structured. And this is not how people normally understand uh, Daniel chapter 11, you know, especially non-Adventists, right? Because they just look at it as all a continuous history. Everything follows one after the other. Is, is this how the book of Revelation is written? Repeat and enlarge. This is how the Bible is written, right? I mean, there is right. some continuity, but it likes to go back and repeat and enlarge. So they keep zooming in to this picture. And, and so we have to sort that out. And we learned that when we went through understanding the lines, how we do that. And we have to, every time you zoom in, you have to create a new line. So that means we actually have a lot of lines here that we haven't even drawn out yet. Because it's not just that they zoom in and they tell us some detail. They actually are giving us a line that represents something. So you can see how much work this is going to be. So this part we have not really truly addressed on a line, right? So when we, right? Because remember, we, we drew a line, but we did the line for, for Papal Rome. Well, that's going to start at verse 30, okay? So that means we don't have lines for verses 25 to 29. We do have a line here for, for pagan Rome, and we even have the line for our history, right? So, so the history of pagan Rome, we have a line. And we do have a line for papal Rome, but papal Rome starts here. But this, we haven't really put on a line. Now, it's part of this line, right? Because you're going to have the Battle of Actium. Um, you're going to have the fall of Rome, 
right? It's going to uh, be in there, right? You're going to have, you know, Octavian and, and Anthony and all those things. So, so there's still a bunch of things that we have to, uh, there's a bunch of things we still haven't answered. So we've got the Roman Jewish League. And the other thing we haven't really drawn on the line itself, because even this, this section here, uh, verses 19 to 22, we haven't really drawn that on the line yet. I mean, this doesn't represent it. So it's going to take us a while. Okay. Well, let's, uh, Close with prayer. <clears throat> Dear Father in heaven, thank you for the study this morning and for the work that you have set before us to accomplish. We ask for your help. We know, Lord, that you are leading us in, in our understanding, and we just pray that we can continue to follow you and listen to your voice. Be with each person, bless them and keep them, and your angels watch over them, and bring us together again to study your word. Is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.